All right. So continuing on talking about tremolo systems on my workbench, yes, I'm shooting multiple Zs in one day because I just felt like doing it and I felt like discussing it. And I don't see these tremolo units on YouTube very much, um, if at all, really. So today's bizarre trem unit that we're going to talk about, or vibrato or whatever, is the Washburn Wonder Bar Shift 2001 trem system. Uh, this was originally released, I think, around 1983, 1984 by a company called Shift 2001. And then it was, uh, I think, bought up and rebranded as the Washburn Wonder Bar by Washburn Guitars. Um, these are a very obscure trem unit. Not a whole lot is known by people by them, except by me. And I actually found this tremolo unit um, in a box of parts back in 2005 at a defunct music store called uh, Hotlicks Music in downtown Everett, Washington. So I've had this one for a while. It's been on a few different guitars, but the Mad Right I consider its final resting place. So for those of you who want to know what guitar this is, my home-built Mad Right Super Moserite guitar. It's shaped like a Moserite, kind of, but it's kind of my own shape. K K17 knack you see even says that on the headstock creeping that mad right it's even got the angry sun from Super Mario Brothers 3 on it its own serial number <laughs> yeah I build my own stuff it's cool looking 70s knobs anyway back to the tremolo so the Washburn Wonder Bar was basically marketed as an aftermarket tremolo that did not require any special hardware to install on your guitar Yes, it would leave uh, four screw holes. It affixes the guitar by two screws up here where the saddles are. And then there's these two holes back here. And yes, I don't have any of the original mounting hardware. <coughs> um, the tremolo had a few, quite a few innovative features. First off, these fine tuners back here can actually tune the strings quite a bit more than a standard tuner can. Uh, if you turn this... Uh, turn this you can actually make the strings pretty sharp or pretty flat another thing it's ambidextrous I don't know if they shift these with two bars but your vibrato bar unscrews like on a Stratocaster on these basically you just uh, unscrew it and yes I don't have a lot of room on my bench for this but it unscrews like that and then just pulls out and then you have this collar here, and you can just unscrew that collar and switch the side, and then you can have a left-handed tremolo unit. So it would fit any guitar without any real modification. There also was a special mounting bracket for this that would reuse the mounting for your uh, Gibson Stoptail Tunematic setup. So you could just bolt it on. It was a basically a mildly destructive to non-destructive modification you could make back in the 80s and what this collar does is it actually does two things it also sort of adjusts the tension on the bar as well as makes it ambidextrous on most of these if you have all the parts there's actually a second plug that goes in that hole mine's fallen out probably because I've gigged this guitar several times guess we're hitting my water bottle Probably should just move that out of the way. Drink your water. Don't kill your kidneys. Anyway, because heaven knows I've come close a few times. Anyway, spin that bar around. There we go. You can, like, adjust the tension on the bar. You can loosen this up and have it waggling around like Eddie Van Halen. Or you can have it tight like I like it. Um, down here you have these. These are, like, fine tuners, but they have way more range than a Floyd Rose. Um, to explain the spring mechanism on it, here's your spring adjustment right here. This adjusts the amount of tension. And this uses a very unique spring setup. And I've never taken it apart to look at it. But as you can see, this whole section here is your tailpiece, and this section is your bridge section. And this tailpiece section has a torsion bar type setup. Basically, in there, you have sort of a curly Q torsion bar spring, and it twists. And that's how you get the tension on the on the spring in there. It's basically by tightening this and it pushes a pawl down in there that makes the spring tighter and makes it makes it pull back up more if you have heavier spring, strings. Now I'd probably say I wouldn't use this tremolo as strings anything heavier than maybe like an 11. 
Um, I got nines on here right now. That's what I use as nines. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the basis of the back. You also have this backstop back here because you could set it up where it's floating like this. Then you have upward and backward movement. Kind of like how uh, you do a Stratocaster trim. Or you could set it up where it sits flat like this. Which is how I have mine. I have it decked. And then that just adjusts it. Um, we'll get to this in a minute. Because this is going to be a longer video than the last one. Because this tremolo has some cool features. <laughs> a cool feature. Anyway, these strings, you notice they come through these little pawls here, and then they go under these rollers. And then these rollers act as a pinch roller for the string, allowing the string to come back up and over the bridge saddle on here. And then when they go over the bridge saddle, they just sort of, they have a secondary roller they go over. And each saddle is adjusted by one uh, Allen screw on each si on the side of it. The three treble, treble side saddles have it on the uh, treble side. Three base have it on the base side. Most likely for stability, but it's a pretty stable bridge. Anyway, the part I wanted to get to, and this is going to be kind of the lesson to learn in this video, and probably one of the more interesting parts of this vibrato unit, is the fact that this is a quasi-transposing tremolo system. Because as you notice, each one of these little pawls here is sitting at a different height, but they're all identical, unlike, uh, say, a Steinberger trans trim, where each one of these is calibrated for the proper fall rate. Got to wonder why nobody at uh, Shift or Washburn ever bothered to get that feature working fully. So, as you can see, the way transposing tremolos work, including the trans trim and this Washburn Wonder Bar, is by having an adjustable fall rate for each string. The way they do it is by adjusting how high up or down the string is. I also think it can probably be done by moving them further back or pushing them further forward. Uh, because the wider the arc, the faster the fall rate. And the smaller the arc, the less the fall rate. On this one it works kind of like if you had a wall here and then you chipped away sections of that wall to make the wall different heights. Because if you look here, like right here, the low E string always is going to have the lowest fall arc on it. When you push this down, it's going to, the low E string, because it's lower tension and it's got also, it's got lower tension and it's also got a bit less strain on there. The fall rate needs to be a lot slower than the other, a lot slower than the other strings. You make that slower by making that pawl go closer to the uh, axis on which this tailpiece pivots, which is right about here. So if I was to put a string in, you know, say, hook it right about there, right about there, right where the pivot post is, you'd have a very minor fall rate as opposed to back here, where if I turn this, the strings just gonna go meow like that. So like. And then this string right here, as you can see, the A string has it quite a bit higher. These are Ernie Ball Super Slinky Paradigms on here. The last set I had on here that was doing all the transposing stuff were Jen Dunlop strings. Uh, I'm going to be experimenting with different string packs with this vibrato. So you can see I had to raise it up quite a bit more because the core is smaller. It, it's at higher tension. And also it just doesn't... Uh, drop as fast at the same arc as the low E. So to get those two to fall at the same rate, I had to crank this pawl way up and then back it off. And as you can see, it was the same deal for the D string. It goes all the way, way up here. I think also the core of the string has a lot to do with this too. Because remember, the E, A, and D, and sometimes your G string, they're all wound with this uh, winding on here. I can't really get it on camera. They're all wound with that winding. And the core has a big part of how it drops as well. That's why these three are like that. Another way you can think of it as far as the fall rate is you can think of it as the inverse of your bridge saddle intonation, although this one should be further back. Like you'd have one there. You just adjust these the opposite way. So this one needs to be closer and these need to be further away to make a bigger fall arc for the smaller strings. 
We move over there, and then all of a sudden, oh, look what happens. Now we got the G string, and it's all the way down here. That's how you get the uh, fall arc um, right for that string now, because it's a thicker core like the low E, and so it needs a much less of an arc to drop and pitch. And this is pseudo -sci my pseudoscience way of explaining it, I must say. I didn't do the science behind this. I did the experimentation to figure out how it works in a practical way. As you can see, our uh, B string also needed to be further down so that it would actually, you know, drop because it's, again, probably a thicker core than even the A string. And then our high E goes all the way up here. Now, I wanted to talk about why I call this a quasi-transposing bridge. First problem is you notice all of these little pawls are basically ex the same. They're built exactly the same way. Same groove depth, same uh, curve o curl over at the end, same everything. If you look at a Steinberger, um, the low E is pretty deep. These, this is shallower. This is shallower. This one's uh, pretty much shallower and closer to the low E than this one's just a little bit higher, probably similar to A or D string. And then the high E, this whole thing would be a solid block because the high E is the one that needs the most pivot arc to actually drop and pitch. I've had some thoughts of machining my own brass pieces that would allow full transposing with regular strings, including these Ernie balls on here, because I've got it pretty darn close. I got the E, A, and kind of sort of the D to work in tone with each other. D and G kind of work well with each other. These two are a little bit off a little bit, but they work well, and B and high E are actually working together. So it was really a compromise, whereas with the other one, I could get pretty much uh, low E through G stay in tune with each other with the Dunlop strings, and these two were just slightly out when I tuned down. It was really, really kind of a trick to get all that working. That's also why um, Steinberger uses compensated strings for this, because it makes them have to do far less milling and special stuff. I think I read somewhere that the Steinberger only had like three different styles of saddle for it. So that kind of explains the deal with these. And that's what makes a Washburn Wonder Bar kind of special. Um, that said, uh, mine stays in tune perfectly well, but you'll notice something goofy here. And this is also a hint for you guys who use a tremolo a lot like me. Um, there's no locking nut. The Shift 2001 and the Washburn Wonder Bar came with a locking nut went over the top right here and it had like six individual holes and you just clamp them all it was actually just a locking string guide and then the strings that go through the regular nut this has none of that this works on what i call the paul dean principle because <clears throat> as we all know i'm a fan of lover boy i have one of paul dean's models and uh, his idea was a 10 degree headstock to tilt in the straight string path when I put this guitar together, I realized I could get away with just not having a string guide at all because the pull for each string is pretty tight over this KKE17 neck. So even the high E has a very nice breakover angle over the nut without a string guide. And then you have this uh, nut here, and I just cut all the slots kind of wide and lubricated them. Yes, it's a little bit off, but I'm fine with it. And it actually sounds and it stays in tune really good. I really don't have to deal with it. Now, if you're wondering there, I've only ever heard of two famous people using a Washburn Wonder Bar on their guitar. And that's, um, well, first off, I saw um, Joe Perry on like a 1989 episode of Saturday Night Live. He had uh, what looked like a Hamer, not a Hamer Standard, but it was like the Hamer DC. It was the double cutaway Melody Maker, Les Paul, double cutaway Junior Special type guitar, and it had one of these on it. I remember being a kid, this thing gave me false hopes that all tremolos stayed in tune going down. So he must have played with these. Um, and then the other one, um, which this is going to be the funniest reference ever, is actually Wayne Campbell, a.k.a. Mike Myers from Wayne's World. Um, he actually has one of these on his Washburn guitar he has when they're doing the old Wayne's World, Wayne's World, party time, excellent, blah, blah, blah thing. You know, the white Washburn he has had one of these on it too. So they were on some production Washburn guitars. I think another one that had it was the Force 1 or Force series, which uh, Kurt Cobain had one of those, but it didn't have the trem on it. It had a regular hardtail. 
So yeah, uh, hopefully it gives you kind of the idea of the Washburn Wonder Bar, at least uh, how it works, how it's attached. And yes, there's no routing under this. This is just solid wood. There's no routing at all required underneath this tremolo unit. I think they even uh, they sold like some backing blocks for strats to put under there. So that kind of explains the tremolo unit and how it works um, for this Washburn Wonder Bar. I might do some. I'm going to probably do some videos on the common tremolo units for some of the that you see too and kind of talk about their setup stuff really this and the geiker i don't have a whole lot of setup tips for because i haven't used the geiker yet and this one really has been pretty cut and dry i haven't really had a lot of problems with it it stays in tune real good even without the locking nut um it it is pretty wild i can get pretty crazy with it um the tuner fine tuners back here work great once you stretch strings out as long as you have your nut and your uh, nut and your uh, tuners all done right. Oh yeah, another thing I must mention. You always want to wrap your strings neatly around the cap stands. That will help any guitar stay in tune well. Especially with the tremolo because when you're pushing this down, like I said, you're dropping the tension on the strings to make them go flat. And when that happens, if you have these all absolute bobbins wound around here, it's going to go Ting, and then you're going to have your string go flat as it goes uh, and falls between the gaps of your uh, barbed wire hay bale wound string. And then you do it again, and then all of a sudden it hangs up on another section and your guitar goes sharp. So that's uh, hopefully some helpful hints and kind of shows you what the Wonder Bar trim works like on these guitars and me kind of explaining how it works.